Good afternoon, and uh, it's great to have all of you here join us today for what I know will be a wonderful webinar, very interesting webinar with Dr. Shannon O'Neill, who is the Vice President of the Council on Foreign Relations, also their Deputy Director of Studies. And we'll be discussing her very insightful new book, uh, The Globalization Myth, which is, I recommend it highly, by the way, very interesting book, uh, about why regionalization uh, more than globalization is really America's best bet for the way forward. Uh, I'm Dr. Richard Downey, the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Orange County here in California. And we're delighted to be able to host this event with our partners, the LA World Affairs Council, Los Angeles World Affairs Council at Town Hall, uh, also the Pacific Council on International Policy, the World Affairs Council of Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, and Global Minnesota, as well as our other fellow councils across the country. So uh, wherever you happen to be, uh, we're glad to have you with us and welcome. Um, by the way, before we get started, I'd just like to mention a couple of events we got we have coming up, which uh, I think you'll find very interesting. Uh, one of them is Dr. Colin Clark, uh, which is uh, on Putin's private army, you know, which is the mercenary group that uh, the, the Russian mercenary group that's working in not only in Ukraine and Africa and other places around the world. Um, our Bastille Day Parisian soiree, which would be a lot of fun uh, on the 15th of July. And uh, our focus on fentanyl, one of our crises coming up in September. So uh, we also have, by the way, or we're really looking forward to our gala in on the 16th of December. Uh, with Lieutenant General Mc, uh, McMaster, who is, uh, as you know, our former National Security Advisor. So that should be a really interesting and fun event. We look forward to uh, as many of you that can, can join us for that one as well. Uh, but uh, today we're focusing on re regionalization and globalization with Dr. Shannon O'Neill. And I we are truly fortunate to have with us today a uh, as moderator, Howard Schatz, uh, who I'll just introduce in a moment, but before I before I do, uh, I, we we want you to be engaged uh, in this this event. And so, uh, at any time during this, please go to the bottom of your screen. You'll see that little box that says uh, Q and A. If you have a question at any time, uh, go into that box, uh, type your question. The format for today will be about twenty five minutes discussion between Howard and Dr. Shannon O'Neill and. Uh, then it will be open to your questions, but you can give your your uh, questions, you'll write your questions in the Q and A box at any time. But uh, as I say, we're we're just so fortunate to have Dr. Howard Schatz with us. He's a senior economist at the Rand Corporation. He's also a professor at Rand's Party Graduate uh, School. Uh, he's a he's he's served on the President's Council of uh, Economic Advisors. He's been a research fellow at the Brookings Institution, as well as the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve. Uh, he's, uh, he also has a PhD from, in pol public policy from Harvard. And his, he's written widely on trade, uh, economics, and, uh, all, and, and uh, labor issues. And his uh, current research has been focused on the economic impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as the US-China competition. So uh, as I say, perfect person to be the moderator for this one. Uh, Howard, we're just delighted to have you with us today. Uh, let me pass the microphone over to you, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Downey, and I'm delighted to be here for this program. Dr. Shannon O'Neill, uh, as Dr. Downey said, is the Vice President, Deputy Director of Studies, and the Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's an expert on global trade, supply chains, Mexico, Latin America, and democracy. And she has firsthand experience with Latin America, having lived and worked in Mexico and Argentina. Her 2013 book, Two Nations Indivisible, Mexico, the United States, and the Road Ahead, chronicles the vast transformations Mexico has undergone and why they matter for the United States. She also has business experience to draw from uh, for her research. She's worked as an equity analyst at Indo-Suez Capital and Credit Lyonnais Securities. She holds a BA from Yale University, an MA from Yale, and a PhD in government from Harvard. I don't think we overlap though, uh, to my misfortune. She shares her expertise in a variety of ways, including testifying before Congress, 
serving as a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, and as a frequent guest on national broadcast news and radio programs. All of this experience has come together in her latest book, The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter, the subject of our discussion today. Shannon and I will talk for about 25 minutes or so about the book and about the subject, and then we'll open it up to your questions and answers. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I will present the questions uh, as they appear. So please welcome Shannon O'Neill. Now, Shannon, the, the title of the book, The Globalization Myth, that in itself is pretty surprising because, because we all know that we've been living in an era of globalization. What's, what's a myth about globalization? Mm -hmm. uh, great, well, thanks Howard and thanks Richard and, and Orange County World Affairs Council, it's great to be here. And you know, there are, in my estimation, there are two myths about globalization or the way we usually think about globalization. And the first myth is that we tend to think about globalization and the way it's portrayed in the media and the like, we tend to think of it as this all encompassing juggernaut that went all around the world. You know, we have books like, like Tom Friedman's where the world is flat and, and everybody's affected by this. But when you actually start looking at economic data and you look at the flows of goods and services and money and people and ideas and all these sorts of things, what you find is not that many countries actually participated in these last 40 plus years of globalization. Uh, and in fact, there are only about two dozen countries, 25 countries to be precise, um, that saw trade really transform their economy, where they saw trade as a percentage of GDP of the overall economy double or more. And in contrast, you see dozens more, 89 countries, where trade as part of their economy either stayed the same, it stagnated, or you saw in a good number of countries, trade as part of their economy actually declined. So there are countries that deglobalized over this last 40 years, these years that we think about as hyperglobalization. So that's the first myth. The second part of this globalization myth is that when goods and people and money and everything went abroad, which they did, we've seen trade go from $2 trillion in 1980 to $22 trillion. You've seen a huge increase. But when that happened, companies didn't usually go to the other side of the world. They didn't truly globalize. Now, we all know particular companies that globalized, right? We can talk about Boeing, which sources from 57 different countries. And there's other, you know, Coca-Cola can be found in every big city and every small town all around the world. I'm not saying that there aren't things that are global, but more often than not, when companies and goods went abroad, they went closer to home. They went to other regions. And, and one statistic that brings this home is the average good that is traded travels about 3,000 miles. And that is the distance between New York and Los Angeles. That doesn't get you to Shanghai. It doesn't get you to Berlin. It doesn't get you to the other side of the world. So it gives you a sense of this closeness. And so when you combine not that many countries participated in quote unquote globalization, and those that did and the companies that did when they went abroad, more of them went closer by than further away. And you combine that and what you've gotten over these last 40 plus years, this you know 40 years of globalization, of the creation of global supply chains and the like, what you've gotten is really three big regions that have become manufacturing and goods hubs, a European one, an Asian one, and a North American one. And between those three, 90% um, of all trade happens. The rest of the world, South America, the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, including India, all together, all of those countries are just 10% of the globe's trade. And so we isn't this is not the globalization that we think, um, and that's why I called it a myth. So, so that puts globalization in a different light, but you raise an interesting issue when you say that we ended up with three manufacturing and trade hubs, which certainly they're, they're talking to each other, they're trading with each other, but trade is concentrated. And so the, the, the issue there is, you know, if we don't have a globalization, is, is regionalization all the same? Do they all do it the same? For example, Europe, how, how did Europe become a region? So they don't do it all the same and they're not as regionalized. Some are more regionalized than others in terms of the concentration of trade and movement and the like. And so Europe is the oldest, the first one to sort of begin this process um, and it is, the path it takes is really a top-down approach. Um, this is integration or regionalization by diplomatic fiat. 
Uh, and when you go around Europe, you know, every big town seems to have a treaty named after it. So the Treaty of Rome, the Treaty of Lisbon, the Treaty of Maastricht, the treaty, every town's got a treaty. And that really gives you a sense of how this integration, this regionalization happened. And so, you know, first they took away the limits on selling and exchanging, you know, steel and coal. And then they took down the tariff barriers for a group of countries that with the European community and that then expanded. Later on, they went after regulations and they created a common market. Then they went after different passports and, you know, they created one passport. Um, they went after the currency and they created one currency for most of the countries there. So it was step by step diplomats coming together, negotiating away the rules or negotiating new rules that brought them together that really brought an integration. And they are today um, the most integrated of the three big regions, almost two thirds of the trade and the movement of money and the like uh, stays within Europe. So Europeans make stuff together and then they sell it to each other, um, but bolstered by these treaties um, and all kinds of institutions that came with it, a European Parliament, a European Commission, a European courts, European Central Bank, all kinds of institutions that really support it. If they have like a European court and European parliament, it sounds a little bit, and it's top down by, by officials, it sounds a little bit like economics may have been one motivation, but economics wasn't necessarily the main motivation, or economics wasn't the only motivation. So it definitely, what, what this? yeah, it was, definitely wasn't the only motivation. I, mean, I think the initial instigus of all of this was Europe was just trying to climb out of the devastation of the Second World War and trying not to get into a third one. You know, they were there and they were had PTSD from the second one, but they knew that the first one was only 20 years before, right? This was a recurring thing. So there was a, a worry that perhaps, you know, Europe would fall into it again. And so um, there are many things they were doing at that time, but part of the economic integration was one, how do we pull ourselves out of this devastation, right? Just cities flattened and, and, and everything shut down. Um, two, how do we stop from fighting? If we trade with each other, maybe we'll, we'll you know, find, find commonality versus division. And three, interestingly, there was a role that the U.S. played here. And we hear in the United States, you read the histories, you hear a lot about the Marshall Plan and the money the U.S. put forward. And there was money, that's for sure. But what they also did, what the U.S. did was not just give them money to rebuild those things, but they also asked slash forced uh, the Europeans <laughs> Um, to come up with a joint plan for spending that money before it'd be doled out. So France didn't say, well, I want this. And Germany said, I want that. All the countries had to come together and really lay out a plan. And so that was really the beginning of these discussions that then you know, caught fire and continued on for the decades to come um, that really brought Europe together. So there was a role in the United States, just one. There were lots of other issues there too, of course. Let's not overstate the US role, but, but it was part of this process and really getting Europeans to begin talking to each other about economics. Um, which they've continued to do. Right, and they've been extremely successful at it, it seems. Extremely <laughs> successful. And they have found a way, you know, we we'll, we can talk about this or people think a lot about, you know, is there room in the world for, a, you know, an economic model that is, you know, high, you know, labor rights and protections and high environmental concerns? You know, it's not, is it, can we just win in globalization with a race to the bottom? And actually a lot of European companies have shown it can, they can be very successful in a place with high wages, with lots of protections and the like, they can be globally competitive. Um, and so there are a lot of different, you know, equilibriums as the way, as the way, uh, you know, economists talk about it, but there's a lot of different paths where you can participate in the global economy and succeed. So, so Europe then was mostly top down. Let's, let's go to Asia, the workshop of the world, as we see, that was a different model. That wasn't necessarily officials and bureaucrats forming treaties and causing their companies to trade with each other. What drove Asia? Yeah, it wasn't at all. And in fact, the, the free trade agreements and the kinds of things that we talk about in Asia came so much later, some of them just in the last few years, frankly, um, but they came much, much later than this integration. And you know, integration in Asia was really led by businesses, by CEOs um, with an assist from governments, but but really a more of a ground up commercial led process. And it started um, in the 50s and really the, the early 60s. Uh, Japan was rebuilding after also being devastated by the war. Uh, they had become a back base for the United States who was fighting the Korean War. And so industry was coming back. And Japan was running out of workers. So they they were the original outsourcers, right? We talked today about outsourcing with the Japanese, you know, 20 years before they had been going to South Korea and places like that in, in military uniforms. Now they were coming back in business suits and they were beginning to set up factories and, and, and outsource the labor intensive part of the production for all kinds of goods they were making for 
Japanese, for the US Army, but also for global markets. Um, and now the Japanese government helped them. So, you know, Mitsubishi or some of these big, you know, uh, conglomerate firms would go and say, I'm going to go put a, you know, put some factories in South Korea. So the Japanese government would say, okay, we'll build a port and we'll face Japan. And so you can get your goods in and out. So they provided some of the infrastructure and the like, but it really was a commercially driven connection. And then, you know, Taiwan and South Korea that had been very poor, where Japanese had gone first, they climbed the value added chain. They went from, you know, initially labor intensive to a bit more sophisticated goods to the point where they too then were outsourcing to their neighbors, you know, to Thailand, you know, later on to Malaysia, to China, when China began to open up um, and to places like Vietnam. So it was, you know, it was a little bit of, a, of an incremental process where you sort of climb the value chain and then you turn to your neighbors. And what that has left, um, but through the companies, um, and what that's really left today in Asia is very robust tied supply chains for all kinds of industries where the regionalization in Asia up until recently or the last 10 years has been about making things together that often you sell to consumers on the other side of the world. Um, that's changed a bit in the last decade. They make things together and now they sell to each other because the Asian consumer is, is increasingly um, robust and wealthy and has billions of dollars to spend um, or yen or, you know, uh, renminbi or all kinds of, uh, you know, currencies. Um, but it is a different model. It's much more of a bottom up model um, that's been very successful as well. Right. You know, you mentioned two things that I want to follow up on. One is you talked about Japan funding ports and other infrastructure. That sounds a lot like what China is doing now with Belt and Road. So, you know, to what extent did Japan help other countries with their infrastructure and then going down the chain? Did other, did other countries, as they became rich, also engage in this kind of infrastructure development? Yeah, we often think of China's rise as this sort of sui generis example around the world. And it is, it is sui generis in the size of, of the population, just, you know, over a billion people and, and sort of the size and the speed in which it happened. But many of the things that China has done were well-trodden paths that they could see ex historical examples in Asia. So Japan started and their overseas development assistance was very infrastructure led. You know, they had a belt and road of, of their own in the 60s and 70s and 80s. They called it something else. But but there you go. It was Miti was, the, you know, the ministry that handled it. But it's basically the same thing. Um, you see the South Koreans and, and, and the Taiwanese and others, once they have gained wealth and, and expertise and technology, they too went out with their overseas development assistance and started building ports or roads or rails to help their companies, their commercial enterprises, and connect them to, um, to their countries, but also to the world. So you see that as well um, as they go forward. Um, much of their, you know, interestingly, much of their investment was focused on China. Um, when they initially went into China, and we talk a lot about Western companies, you know, coming to China and, and taking advantage and foreign direct investment as sort of the early opening up of China. But Asian countries and Asian companies have invested far more in China um, than Western companies have. And some of the most famous, quote unquote, Chinese companies, right, or those that are based in China, things like Foxconn and others that make Apple phones, those are Taiwanese companies. Um, and they were some of the first to go in, interestingly. So Yes, you do see states uh, focusing on infrastructure as, as a way to sort of help their own economies, um, both at home, but, but abroad. Um, but it is often led by, by this, these commercial interests. Um, and it's only later in the 1990s, you start getting some free trade agreements um, throughout, you know, in ASEAN, Southeast Asia and the like. Uh, more recently, seen, you know, more, I think, robust and ambitious free trade agreements in, in Asia, you know, the TPP, which became the CPTPP, which we started as part of the United States, and then we decided not to be part of, and it became, it crosses the Pacific, but it's a big Asian agreement as part of it. Uh, and then most recently, you see what's called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is about 14, 15 countries, including China, including South Korea and Japan coming together, and a, it has a lot of interesting um, treaty arrangements taking down tariffs, regulations, rolling up rules of origin so you don't pay differences depending on, on you know, pieces and parts go across. And all of that will make these supply chains that were initially sort of begun by companies, it will make them more advantageous and I think more robust as we go forward. So you also mentioned China, right, as being big. China is big, but it's not different. It's, it's not different. part yes. of the Asian story. 
Yes, in fact, it's it's an exemplar of the Asian story. So China's success to me is a story of regionalization, right. uh, as much if not more than globalization. And and you see this in China's trade when it first started. Um, it was importing most of the capital goods and most of the more sophisticated things. And companies like Foxconn and other were coming in that had the technology and using very cheap Chinese labor and the supports from the Chinese government. They were they were very involved here, right? They were giving free land and, and making sure labor showed up and they were providing you know, electricity and all kinds of stuff that you needed in special economic zones. Um, like South Korea, Taiwan, even Japan, um, they focused on increasing their own domestic industries, creating some national champions and the like. And interestingly, you know, following the path of, of some of these other Asian countries, they now are going out. They're going out with infrastructure, but they're going out with their own foreign direct investment. So their companies are going out and, and seeding the more labor intensive parts of their industries to you know, Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam or Cambodia and the like, and keeping the more technologically sophisticated parts of it. Um, so, so, you know, there is a, a pattern that started in the, you know, in the post-war period um, and China's sort of the latest and, and, and quite successful, I would say, iteration of, the, of this path. Now, you mentioned the United States when you were talking about both regions, right? In Europe, you said that US, the US forced a joint plan to some extent, and in Asia, when Japan started taking off, the Korean War and, and US activity there uh, was certainly very helpful. And yet the US, which had its hand in these two very successful regional integration efforts, has its own region. And this has been a very different integration effort and not really, it hasn't really gone as far as the other two. So what's, what's, how has North America integrated top down, bottom up? What are the mechanisms? Yeah, so North America has been a little bit of a Goldilocks middle, um, but not in a good way, you know, the way we actually think about it. So it has, you know, not enough top down. It's a little top down. And, you know, NAFTA was the main treaty that that really helped with integration, which has now been followed up with the USMCA, so its successor. Um, and that provides, you know, basic, it takes down tariffs, um, it provides investment guarantees. Um, it provides some, you know, rules of the road and things that make it easy to invest across the three countries and move goods across the three countries. So it helped with that. But you didn't create, um, you didn't create an infrastructure fund that would build the infrastructure that would help the movement the way the Europeans did. You didn't create, you know, courts or parliaments or all kinds of other things that really would give NAFTA more than just a trade treaty um, aspect or even deepen um, some of the, the rules and, and regulations that would really bring the three countries together. So you didn't have that top-down version. And then you had some bottom-up. Um, and you know we've seen some industries really um, use NAFTA to become successful, regionally successful, and, and even globally successful. And I think the, the best example here is the auto industry. Uh, I think you know arguably without NAFTA, there's a question about whether you'd really have a North American auto industry and, and one that's really based and concentrated in the United States. Um, because of NAFTA, we do. Um, have one is a quite robust and very competitive one. So that is an industry that has utilized the economies of scale and specialization, um, the three countries that this, you know, continental workforce and different, you know, natural resources, access to capital, labor, and all the like um, that's done successfully. Um, aerospace is another one um, where we've seen some regionalization. Um, processed foods is another one. But you haven't seen the, the breadth and depth that you see in Asia where you have, you know, Factory Asia that makes half of all the globe's goods. Um, and you see this in the numbers. You know, if Europe is, you know, almost two thirds of all its trade happens within Europe, Asia went from 30% of trade staying within Asia in 1980 to 60% today. And in North America, so Canada, the United States, and Mexico, um, it was about 40% before NAFTA was signed. In the decade after NAFTA, it went up to 47, 48%. So almost one out of every two dollars was trading within the region. Uh, and then after 2001, it fell back down to about 40%. Um, so it's integrated. Uh, it's When you look at South America or Africa or South Asia, their trade with their neighbors is less than 15%. When, when they trade, they trade far, far away, not with their neighbors. So North America is much more integrated than big parts of the world. But it lags behind Asia and Europe. And I would argue that that's part of the explanation for lots of the challenges we have here in the United States in terms of labor and competitiveness and the like um, is the lack of integration, not the fact that we are. Right. Well, it is that integration 
is what has spurred people to be concerned or that integration has been pegged as a cause of what people are concerned about, which is labor, you know, people underemployed, people not being able to find jobs. I, I think one of, one of the most surprising things I learned in your book was that, you know, regionalizing, buying and selling within North America is actually much better for U.S. employment than, re, than, than globalizing to other countries. So, you know, if we manufacture in Mexico, they use U.S. inputs. What, what is the mix in terms of globalization versus other causes? What's driven some of those, some of those labor problems? And, and what has been the role of globalization here? You know, it's... These well, I'm sorry, I should say... Re yes, yeah. <laughs> so there's a few different things going on here. And, and you know, I, I start off the book talking about my hometown. Um, and so I grew up in Akron, Ohio, which, you know, once upon a time was the rubber capital of the world in the 1950s and 60s. One out of every two tires made around the world came out of there and it brought, you know, um, innovation and it brought great wealth. It was, a, you know, it was a, a great city. And um, in the 1970s, it started to hit the skids, um, you know, it was had facing competition from uh, Japanese tire makers that had different kinds of technology that was better technology and were more efficient. It was facing competition from European makers, Michelin from France and Continental from Germany. And by the early 1980s, the last tire came off of a, a factory line in, in Akron, Ohio, and none have been made since. Um, and you saw really in the 80s, you know, a town that had been vibrant, um, lose people rather than bring people in. And you saw, you know, Factories closed, restaurants shuttered, all, all the kinds of things. The kinds of things that we talk about is, you know, the defining of the Rust Belt, I would say. Um, and, you know, lots of people would say, you know, Akron is the classic example of a victim of globalization. This is what globalization does. Um, but what I would say is actually there's a little bit of something else happening here. Um, and what Akron was, was not just a victim of globalization. It was a victim of the lack of regionalization. Um, and so Akron was facing Japanese tire makers, but Japanese tire makers and car companies were sourcing from all over Asia. So they have these robust supply chains that allowed them to be innovative at, at affordable costs. And that's what they were competing against. And in Europe, you know, you had the European community. So you had six countries all together and they too had economies of scale that, that they could compete and, and provide, you know, high quality, low cost tires. And Akron, Ohio, and the United States um, was alone. NAFTA was a decade away, and there was no way to build up these economies of scale and specialization and, and lower prices. And so alone, Akron um, stumbled and, and, and the industry finally fell, and, and all those companies were, were sold off to their competitors. Um, let me give you a story of a different town that's just a four-hour drive away that had a different experience. Um, and this is the town of Columbus, Indiana. Columbus, Indiana is the home of Cummins Engines, so a big engine maker for trucks and you know, heavy machinery vehicles and the like. Um, it was started in the 1920s. Um, it had a huge boom in the post-war period as all the world was rebuilding. A lot of them used Cummins engines, um, but they too hit hard times in the 1970s. Um, they were losing contracts with Ford and GM to uh, Japanese uh, um, engine makers. Um, they were facing competition from Mercedes and, and BMW and others who made great engines also in the, in the commercial space. And they too almost went under in the 1980s. They managed to hang on to the 90s and arguably I would say NAFTA saved Cummins engines. Um, so with NAFTA, Cummins was able to move some parts of production to Mexico and lower their labor costs. Um, by doing that, they were able to gain back contracts they lost to the Japanese um, because they could compete with them on price and quality. Um, they had a whole market of 120 million people that were opened up to them. And in fact, today, Cummins engines, if you're on a highway in Mexico and there's a big truck behind you, probably a Cummins engines that's, you know, coming up and almost hitting you as they like careen down those hills. I, I lived in Mexico, so I can speak from experience. Um, all of those engines built at a New York state factory. Um, and so Cummins went from, you know, on the edge to a much bigger company than ever been in terms of market cap and, and sales. Um, many of those factories are still located in the United States. Uh, it's become, you know, one of the biggest trading companies out there. Um, and it's thrived precisely because of NAFTA. Um, and so I think that's difference there tells you something about regionalization within globalization. When you 
Um, and you know, the thing that I think we sometimes miss um, in our discussions is as Europe was rebuilding, as Asia was rebuilding from World War II, and they were devastated by World War II in the ways that we weren't on our own soil, except for Hawaii, um, as they were rebuilding, you know, they did it together. They took a regional model. And by the 70s and 80s, you know, the United States was competing against these manufacturing teams. And it was sort of like they were playing team manufacturing and we were still trying to play singles on our own. And, and that I think is some of the challenge. And so for, you know, if you can't beat them, you got to join them. So for some of the ways for us to provide more jobs and provide more US-based companies, we need to think about how we too can regionalize to make, you know, high quality goods that are affordable that we can sell not just to US customers, but to the, you know, 8 billion people that live all over the world. That is going to be a, a topic we're going to need to address is what the US should do now. But before we do that, I do want to think about the future. There are a number of things about the future. One is what should the US do? But the other is, you know, what we've described now uh, is mostly in the past. This is how the world has developed. Now, Monday night, true story, I was on a phone call long distance for free with someone I know in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, right? You could not have done that 30 years ago. And so this kind of with technology, with, te with technology changing, with transportation infrastructure changing, it, is this an indication that we're actually going to have true globalization or, or is the momentum really in favor of further regionalization? How do you see the future developing in this case? I think there's a few things here. So what, what we've seen over these last 40 years, just looking back before we look forward, is even with you know, the huge plummeting in the cost of transportation with containerization and, and other innovations where it doesn't cost that much to send things physically, even with low cost or no cost, you know, Zoom and Skype and all these kinds of you know, voice over IP where it doesn't cost anything, right? We just get on. Even with that, we have not seen true globalization. And I think that is kind of the most surprising but pretty firm and robust finding of the last 40 years. Um, and so the question is, well, maybe that's gonna change now because Zoom has just gotten so easy. We're now we now we all use it, here we are today, and, and that's what it's gonna be going forward. But I would caution um, buying that idea wholesale because there is a cost to, even if there's no physical cost to us connecting today, there is a cost there. And you know, interestingly, there's a, a study that was done by McKinsey where they surveyed about 600 companies and they, they looked into their operations. And, and what they found was that when companies went abroad, <clears throat> they improved their profit margins. But the further the way they went geographically, then their profit margins started to come back down. Um, and, so and so McKinsey, they always have good taglines. So they called it the globalization penalty is that, you know, this sort of like there's a happy medium. You, you go abroad and you gain profits and then all of a sudden you lose profits. And, you know, they try to explain it. I don't think they have a, you know, they, they sort of throw out some ideas. But, you know, there's something about this that, yes, you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world as you just did. But um, it's not always easy. You're in different time zones. You know, you speak different languages. And even if you speak the same language, you know, the accounting systems you're used to, the legal systems you're used to, what it means when says someone says, I'm going to get that to you tomorrow. Does it really mean tomorrow or does it mean something else? You know, do they, do they, you know, is conflict a part of a work environment or do people work together on teams? You know, manufacturing today and services and all kinds of, of production today is a pretty complex process. And the more you spread it out and the more you, the longer your supply chains, the more complex it is. And so here, team building and trust and understanding and implicit or knowledge, those things really matter for profits. And the further away you get in terms of distance and time zones and, and customs and things, the harder it is to manage those people. And so I think even without it costing any money to pick up that phone or turn on that video, there's still a cost to being on the other side of the world that, that we haven't solved yet. Maybe AI will solve it, but as long as there's people involved, I think there is something about uh, about that um, that's going to be hard to change. Right. So, so reports of the death of distance are are, are exaggerated. Exactly. Um, I think they're exaggerated. And then I I would say as we look forward, um, there are a lot of factors out there that are changing calculations for the current kind of footprint of manufacturing and production. And some of those, some of them lean towards more globalization, and you know, cheaper and cheaper, you know, um, connections is one of them. Um, perhaps AI is another where, you know, things can be done anywhere. But other things I would say will actually, I think, reinforce regionalization. Um, so one of these is climate change. 
um, both the effects of climate change, right? It costs money if thing, you know, if your ship gets caught on the seas or ports flood, and it's going to be harder to move stuff around. Um, but to the policies to combat climate change, um, and so far every extra mile that you travel um, is, uh, you know, more emissions um, until we get to somehow, you know, zero for, you know, net emissions where there where you don't emit any carbon. So. Um, so I think there will be a preference from consumers, but also for companies that pledge net zero um, to not produce things so far away, right? Because it's, it's, it makes it much harder for them to do business. So that's one thing. And the other thing we've seen, especially um, in this last couple of years, and I, um, I think we're at the beginning rather than the end of this, is um, geopolitics overlaying all of this and increasing tensions between the United States and China and, and other places around the world. And so as you see a fragmentation of some robust supply chains between the US and China, or even China and Europe um, to a lesser extent, but still there, um, I think you will tend to see a little bit more regionalization because it's not always the case, um, but more often than not, you know, the countries that are your allies, that you have your free trade agreements with, that you have sort of markets with, they often tend to be closer than further away. Right. Great. Well, eventually, at some point, before we end, I do want to hear about what we should do next. But first, I'd like to go to the audience to see what, what their questions are. Uh, no doubt they'll be pretty good. I'll start. Um, so, and, and again, I encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A box, and I will uh, read them through. Uh, so I'll start. Europe has a storied history of offering financial secrecy for money from around the world. Honest and questionable. What role, if any, does that play in it becoming and remaining a global economic hub? Well, I was just in London uh, last week, and I have to say I've heard more Russian on the streets than I've heard in a long time. So I, I appreciate, yes. Um, I, I don't know if that has anything to do with the money, but it definitely was a presence that, uh, you know, you don't feel here in New York where I, where I live. So fair enough um, on that. You know, we do see, you know, Switzerland's famous for this, other places are famous for being um, financial hubs. Um, but <clears throat> interestingly, when you look at data on bank loans, when you look at data on mergers and acquisitions, Europeans tend to invest in each other. Um, so when European banks um, are making loans, um, very little of it goes um, to other parts of the world. There's some that don't, you know, HSBC and others do have big presence in, in China and the like, but when you look at the overall amount, um, most of it stays within the region. Um, when you look at mergers and acquisitions, um, more often than not, European companies are buying European companies rather than American or Chinese or others coming in. Um, so I think there is, yes, there's money from the outside and there's places where people go to put their money into safe havens or, or to um, you know, keep it from, from other places. But um, that, that money tends to be the larger aggregate. We definitely see sort of a centripetal force, um, a regional regionalization of many of the money flows. Um, within Europe. And, you know, in contrast, I would say, um, if you really want to look at where the global flows are, and maybe this is why North American integration is a little bit less, is, um, is the United States. I mean, yes, certain types of people like to put their money in, in Swiss bank accounts or, or did at one time in, 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 or in London and the like, London real estate. Um, but it's really the United States that, you know, has become sort of the global host. It's, you know, the dollar is still dominant, despite, you know, many, uh, Various countries not always happy with the dollar's dominate, you know, dominance of, of the whole financial system. Um, you know, as we saw just recently when the U.S. was going through um, their debt ceiling angst um, and people were worried around the world, people fled to treasuries rather than away from them, even though we didn't really know the future of treasuries for, for a few days there. So I think there really is, you know, there, if you really want to look for global money flows and protection, I think the United States is still sort of top dog, um, not Europe. Yeah. Um, well, yes, with our power, with sanctions and, and uh, it's, always, exactly. it's always, you'll always, you'll always be able to find dollars overseas. I once bought a uh, carpet in uh, rural Turkey uh, and the person I bought it from to give me change pulled out a wad of 20s. I was very <laughs> impressed. Exactly. <laughs> now, you know, so, so regionalization, you, you've told us a lot of the advantages of regionalization and yet and yet our political leaders, and it seems almost mm. unique to US political mm. leaders, have really come down across the aisle against trade agreements. And these are agreements that would, that would help our relations with other countries. Uh, and you know, we've built this very large network of partners and allies. We of all the major countries in the world have really made the best use 
of, of, of alliances and partnerships. And yet there's this, this resistance. What do you think does explain the unpopularity of trade agreements right now in the political world? Yeah, you know, I think some of this is a misdiagnosis. Um, and some of it, I think, is just by mistake. And some of it maybe, you know, um, politicians and others with, with you know, with a, with a soapbox or with, you know, ability to influence purposely sort of moving away from things. And, you know, you look at the United States and, and from, you know, the 1970s today and the world of work um, has gotten less secure. You know, you look back in the you know 50s and 60s, and you started a company, and you were likely to finish at that company. And um, there are a few now who you know would would see their whole you know get their you've got a lot of cool mugs behind you, so maybe you'll be one of them. But you know, few that get their like gold watch at the end because they've been there their whole life, right? <laughs> um, so there's a fragility to to the workforce, and as we know too, we've seen you know a, a uh, separating of sort of, you know, higher educated, higher paid Americans from those who, who are not. So there is a real challenge there. And I think the, the issue here is that what's the diagnosis? Is this really trade agreements um, that have caused this? Uh, and, you know, I, there I'd answer no, actually, right? I mean, some of it is technology, some of it is changes there. Some of it is places where we don't have trade agreements. You know, there are some great economic papers out there about you know, the effect of China coming into the world system. And, you know, one of, one of them is called the China shock. And, you know, they estimate somewhere between one and 2 million Americans lost their jobs um, because of that. But, you know, we famously don't have a free trade agreement with China. Um, and when you look at the economic data uh, about NAFTA and, and sort of, you know, Mexican jobs, and there, um, if you read stuff around Washington, you know, there are some figures out there that people put out that say, oh, you know, we've lost almost 200 million, 200,000 jobs a year to NAFTA. Um, the problem with those calculations is the people who do that, they only count the one side of the ledger. They just look at the imports coming in from, from Mexico, from Mexico to the United States. And they say, oh, it's, you know, X billion dollars. And so that's about 200,000 jobs if all of that was done here in the United States. Um, but they don't count the exports, US exports to Mexico. Um, so if you add the US exports to Mexico, that's about 200,000 jobs too. So it's basically a wash um, in terms of overall. And what this gets at is really what regionalization is about. And it is a few things here. So one is that when a factory opens up in Mexico, they're far more likely to buy supplies or to buy pieces and parts that will go into that car or that airplane or that machine or anything from the United States. Uh, and in fact, when we look at uh, data from the Commerce Department, imports that are coming into the United States from Mexico, on average, about 40% of those imports were actually made in the United States. Now, when something comes in from China, less than 5% of that product was made in the United States. Um, if you dove down, a big percent would be made in South Korea and Taiwan and, and Vietnam and other parts of Asia, because that's the Asian supply chain but almost nothing's made in the United States. So if a product comes in from China, it is, it is gonna replace US-based jobs. It isn't gonna have any US input. If it's made in Mexico, it's gonna have a big part of US input. The other kind of dirty secret or, or sort of unoverlooked, I would say overlooked issue here is that the United States actually has very few free trade agreements, preferred access to very few markets around the world. We have preferred access where we don't pay tariffs, we don't pay, have you know, extra regulations like to less than 10% of the globe's GDP. Mexico and Canada, on the other hand, they have preferred access to 60% of the globe's GDP. So if a factory is making a car in Mexico, they can send that car to Europe tariff-free and sell it. If that car is assembled in North Carolina, it will have a 10% tariff when it goes to Europe, which means no one will ever buy it. But if you can make that engine in the United States and put it in that car in Mexico, it can sell to Europe, it can sell to countries in Asia, it, it has much better grasp. And so that means more sales for US-based companies and more workers get more jobs. So I think what we need to do and where I don't see our political system doing is thinking about, do we want a bigger slice of a small pie, which is basically the US market because of protection? Or do we want maybe a slightly solid, smaller slice of the global pie, which is 8 billion people? Um, and I would vote for that. But to get to that, you need regionalization. You need to, you need to manufacture across countries so you get sort of high quality and lower price that allows you to compete. Right. 
Right. Um, so we were talking about business so far and economics. I want to do I want to do a little bit of a shift because we have a couple of questions that take us keep us with integration with regionalization, but go a little beyond the economic side. So USMCA, US Mexico Canada Agreement, uh, which that that has the core is the North American countries, and they have a history of comparatively limited economic integration, certainly compared to Europe, as you said, but they're very integrated demographically. And they're integrated demographically with the Caribbean and the Central American countries as well, raising a whole set of issues that are both international and domestic that call out for policy responses. Mm -hmm. is, is there a way if we think about, and, and we're, we're starting to move kind of in the policy world now, but you know, if we, if we think more about North America beyond economics, but as, as economics as people, is there a way to widen that lens to make the case for regional integration? Or do you think that thinking beyond economics could be a political problem? You know, I think we're going to have to think beyond economics because migration is, is a big part, as we all know, of our politics today. Wherever you fall along that line, it's a big part of the politics, and it's going to continue to be a big part of the politics. Um, as, you know, right now in the Western Hemisphere, more broadly, we see um, really an unprecedented number of people who are on the move. Um, you know, just to give you a, a, a figure, right now in the world, there are 100 million displaced people, either internally in their country or, or internationally. Um, 20 million of that 100 million are in the Western Hemisphere, um, in Latin America. Um, and this is a part of the world that only has 8% of the population. So it has 20% of the displaced people, 8% of the global population. So what that tells me is migration is going to be an issue. So that's one area I do think the United States, you know, we have long been um, a place where migrants come. Um, I, I won't ask about, or I, I won't know what your, Howard, what your uh, lineage is, but as you can see with a name like Shannon O'Neill, it probably came, you know, it was back a while, but you know, my parents arrived here, not, they, they weren't here at the beginning, let's put it that way. So, um, and I would imagine many people on this call, that's the case too. So I think it's been a long part of our history. So has, um, backlash against migration that too has been a long part of our history and I think we're we're in one of those phases um, but to bring migration into a little bit of this economic commercial and competitive side as I do look forward as we're talking about what do you, you know what's going to change as we look forward you know increasingly um, the globe's demographics are changing um, and so places that once were very competitive because they had uh, growing demographics, and so they had lots of labor, China being the example here, um, are now um, in demographic decline. And, you know, the numbers, for instance, just to talk about China for a second, the numbers are really astounding here. <clears throat> in the next 15 plus years, 100 million people are going to leave the workforce of China um, due to demographics. You know, the whole U.S. workforce is 165 million people. And they're going to lose 100 million people in the next 15 plus years. I mean, think about sort of the shifts there. And so Europe, too, has and China's not the only one in Asia that has declining demographics. There's others as well. Europe, too, has some complicated demographics and, and, and on the decline. And the United States and, and North America more broadly has um, has actually been better in terms of overall you know, demography, in large part because of, of migration. And as you look forward, as I talk to you know CEOs or others who are working in the business world, as they look forward, human capital is going to be as important as physical capital, um, as you know other kinds of you know in financial capital. Um, and so, where do you find human capital? Where do you find a concentration of people who are able to you know do the jobs of the future and really bring a robustness and vibrancy to the economy? Um, you know what, it's going to be migration. So I think that is definitely part, it's part of a human story and a community story and a moral story and lots of other things, but it is the nuts and bolts of this economic competitive story. You know, if the United States is going to be a thriving economy and dynamic and innovative and all of those sorts of things, a big part of that story is going to be migration. And it's going to be migration from our neighbors and, and other parts of the world. So, right. So migration, then what you're what you're saying, and I'll, I maybe we'll put words in your mouth. But as I think about this, it not only brings labor force benefits, all right, as opposed to many of our competitor regions, but it also brings those uh, regional connections, global connections. You had mentioned earlier, 
you know, it's easier to do business in your own language. It's easier to do business with customs that are familiar. The United States, because of migration, has this whole stock of people who understand the customs of our, of our whole neighborhood. And so, you know, there are a couple of questions about this. It's kind of getting into the role of, of, of you know, consciousness of globalization. Uh, you know, to, to what extent do you think in the United States, kind of people lead globalization as opposed to policymakers or a globalization mindset leads globalization? And let me, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're coming up to the end. So let me lead from that, right? We talk about a mindset or consciousness for globalization leading to uh, 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 some uh, affinity for regionalization, affinity for doing business overseas. That does lead to, well, what should policymakers do, right? Going forward, what should they do in the next five years? What are the three things you would advise them to do now? Yeah. So I wouldn't argue for just globalization for globalization's sake, right? Uh, I mean, I found a huge richness in, in my personal life, you know, traveling and seeing the other parts of the world. And I highly recommend everybody to do it, but I, but I don't think it's, you know, we should just be globalists for some reason. Um, but I do think as we think about how, you know, if the role of a democratic government or the aspiration of a democratic government is to um, bring more prosperity, to bring more opportunity, to bring more equality and, and well-being, if that's what you know, make life better for those um, that voted you in, um, then I think internationalization is actually the way, the almost only way that you can do it um, in, at scale. Um, where you help lots of people. Now, we, you can do it in the wrong way, so it doesn't help lots of people, it only helps certain people, or it doesn't help a lot, many people at all, but I do think it is the path out. And the reason I think that is because, well, one, just historically, you know, countries that close themselves off and, and, and disconnected from the world never became rich and prosperous. It's just it's very few cases. That's so, you know, autarky doesn't lead you anywhere, right? Um, and I think particularly, in the world today, which is not just, you know, we all have subsistence farming and, you know, you grow potatoes and I'm going to grow, you know, I don't know, you know, carrots and we'll all have a nice stew, right? You know, we care, we want iPhones, we want technology, we want GPT chat, you know, we want our chat GPT, we want all these things. So that is, that really needs, you know, the concentration of, of ideas from, from all over the world and the like. Um, but to bring prosperity, this is where I actually think, you know, it may not be not too far, not too close. You know, the, the kind of regionalization middle is a successful way to go. Um, and we have examples of that from Europe. We have examples of that from Asia. And I think that too could be one for, for North America and, and other parts of, of the Western Hemisphere, frankly, here, where you can get to economies of scale and innovation and, and specialization that allow you to be competitive, so to have US-based companies and US-based jobs, um, but allow you to draw on what's happening all over the world, the vibrancy there. So I think, you know, shutting yourself down, the protectionism in the end is just costly for those who are within that protectionist regime. Um, but I also understand the sort of unfettered globalization where you just open everything up um, is not just scary, but I think at times can be counterproductive as well. So I think there is sort of a happy medium. Um, and then so in terms of policy, you know, what that means is um, I do think, you know, free trade agreements and opening up other markets. So actually U.S. based goods have a fighting chance in markets, which, you know, they don't. I mean, one of the things of us pulling out of TPP is now that 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 agreement is is live is like is lots of U.S. products when you want to sell them to Japan or Australia, other places, you, they have tariffs on them and they don't, don't come from other countries. So you're no longer competitive in those markets. And we're going to see more of that with, you know, other kinds of free trade agreements that we're not part of. So I think that's part of it. Um, but part of it is how do you build this regional platform that really allows this production? So part of that's lowering logistics costs. So that means investing in infrastructure the United States, but crosses borders and connects us to those other countries. Um, part of that's thinking about a continental workforce, um, not just, you know, us, but how do you get complementary skills? How do you make sure that, that, you know, the 450, 500 million people that live on the North American continent um, are all part of, of that process? Um, but I think a big part is shifting our mindset. You know, we've already like, you know, Washington doesn't seem to like this, but realizing that our, our neighbors help us rather than hurt us in this in this overall, you know, manufacturing or, you know, commercial competition. That's So you've there. mentioned, right, there are practical steps and then uh, more conceptual steps. The conceptual step 
is the shifting of the mindset. The practical steps are trade agreements, much better logistics, and making better use of the continental labor force. So the many engineers who are graduate from Tech de Monterey, for example, uh, who could really contribute to prosperity uh, and our Canadian, Canadian students as well. Do all this, and this is the last question in the chat. We do all this and we become a more cohesive region. Is there a risk that, that you know, with a cohesive, with three cohesive regions, is there a risk of a clash between them? Are we raising, you know, the chances of some kind of conflict in some way if we are more self-contained? Mm -hmm. You know, well, the world's not a, a peaceful place right now, as we all know. So, I, you know, not having it, I'm not sure it's really done us, it's done us a whole lot of good, I would say. Um, you know, I worry more, actually, about um, if we see North America be successful and Asia and Europe double down in this time right now, where I do see a fluidity to global supply chains due to geopolitics and other changes. As I see that, I worry about the dozens of other countries that didn't benefit much or didn't win in the last round of globalization. So South America, Africa, South Asia, the Middle East, you know, these are places that they also want to thrive. They also want to prosper. And if you see the three regions sort of, you know, double down and, and gain um, and they're left out in the margins, I worry more about instability and frustration of their populations, you know, whether democracies or not. Um, then I worry about sort of, you know, clash of the titans, sort of great power competition between right. economic regions. And, you know, sadly, we have enough great power competition happening already here um, for, for other reasons, I would say. To, um, so I'm not sure this would really add fuel to that fire. Right. Well, that was terrific. That's a terrific answer. I need to do this too. I need to hold up the book too. It's a terrific <laughs> book. Um, and now I'd like to hand the, uh, the platform over uh, back to Dr. Downey. Thank, thanks, Shannon. Really great. appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much, Howard. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, Howard and Shannon, thank you both so much for a wonderful discussion. This has really, really been fascinating. I, uh, I, I would love to have you both back in person. By the way, uh, we've, I, I'm sure if you, when you were, by the way, for our audience, uh, Shannon's in New York and Howard's in Washington D.C. right now. But uh, please, open invitation to both of you. Whenever you're passing through, please let us know. We'd love to have, have continued this conversation in person, uh, either or both of you at the same time. So look forward to it. So thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, let me also thank our audience for some great questions out there that uh, that you that you gave. And I want to especially thank our partners uh, for hosting this event uh, from the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, the Pacific Council on International Policy, the World Affairs Council of Cincinnati, not far from your home there, Shannon, and uh, and Northern Kentucky. Uh, as well as Global Minnesota and our other our councils across the country. Uh, and uh, just one last reminder, uh, we'd like, love to see you at our, our upcoming event on the 28th of June uh, with Dr. Colin Clark. At, that'll be at Chapman University uh, on Putin's private armies about the Wagner Group. So again, thank you. Thank you both so much uh, for this wonderful conversation today. And, uh, and uh, best wishes to all of you out there, wherever you happen to be. So thank you so much. Bye now.